it's impossible for you to be here and not begin to think critically about any of the biases that you have. It's difficult. I mean, you can try your damnedest to avoid it, but it's it's been developed in such a way that even if you don't change how you think about it, you've had to think about it. And I think that that's an important step. The first step is having that thought. And so I think that Williams does that for people. There's a tradition here. There are people who have generations of ancestors, you know, um, who've gone to Williams. The healing process is being aware of the past. Yeah. And I think the more people who are aware of it will understand uh, why Williams is working very hard to um, be diverse in so many ways. Williams is a great place. We've been around for 210 years. We've always done a great job, I think, of educating our students and preparing them for the world. But a William slot was very much restricted throughout the vast majority of the history. So for pretty much 175 of the 210 years, uh, it was only open to men. So all of you women, bye-bye. No spot for you. It was only open to Americans. Anybody from other countries? I know we have this extraordinary list of students from all over the world. Nope, bye-bye. Never admitted, only open to Americans. Uh, it was only open to Caucasians. If you're African-American, uh, Latino, Asian-American, nope, a couple of tokens, and we proudly celebrate them as members of the class of this and that. It was easy to remember them. You can count them on one hand, how many African-Americans, Latinos, and Asian-Americans we had until very fairly recently. No, it certainly is, a, though, a dark purple underbelly yeah. of Williams, I think, if we're going to um, <laughs> stick with the color purple. Yeah. Um, and it's a story that's not widely known, and I think should be. The people in the first generations who were faculty were, by and large, very religious people. It was uh, people who were congregationalist types, you know, which were, means, means that they were uh, descendants of, of Puritans and that uh, remained the character of the college, I think, throughout the 19th century, that kind of conservative core. Uh, the post-slavery era, post-Reconstruction era, did uh, result in some efforts on the part of the northern types to reach out to the black uh, population, ex-slave population, and so forth. Interestingly, the history of the admission of black students to elite universities in the North, in New England in particular, uh, tracks the history of social movements uh, focused on racial issues. Well, pre-civil rights, the students that stand out most are obviously Gaze Bolin and also Allison Davis and his brother. Bolin, the first African-American student in the 1890s, um, spoke warmly of, of his experience here. Alison Davis, I know, was here in the, I believe, the early 30s. They had a tough time. They lived off campus. Um, they were really outside things. But he, he ended up as valedictorian here. So did his brother John, who was later a trustee here, uh, also a sociologist, not quite as distinguished, but another valedictorian. They were the children, by and large, of a very self-disciplined, very ambitious professional class. It's not surprising that they did so well when they came to places like Williams. But they, their social lives were very constricted. It was very difficult for them because the culture on the campuses was not friendly to uh, African Americans. Uh, there was no organized student life in the way that we think of it in, in most places. Uh, fraternal organizations had begun to um, dominate and people lived in fraternity houses. Um, in any case, the housing that they lived in, uh, they did not want black people living in. 
And so that was difficult, especially in a college like Williams, which is not urban, not a lot of other housing opportunities. But black students continue to live off campus, and that was true in the 1920s when people like Sterling Brown and Allison Davis came here. They had to live off campus. And I imagine there's a certain kind of, you know, one of the things that some people complain about here, even now, is a certain kind of, uh, well, how should we put it, insensitive politeness. <laughs> In Boland's day, it was less marked, but by the 30s, this place was a fraternity college with the fraternities very, very powerful here. Housing, I believe, 90% or 80-plus percent of the student body with a lot of control, therefore, over student life with a bunch of 18-year-olds making decisions of who to exclude and who to admit. Horrible system for African-Americans in that era. This is a miserable place. Uh, academically, it was valuable, but socially terrible. Williams College is a strange place, you know. In the 60s, it stopped, it stopped the Greek system. That was a very brave thing to do mm. for a place like this, and they did it. I think they were second or third, like Princeton did it, and I think Williams followed on mm. in the 60s. So Williams College has its history of being innovative and brave and courageous, and the, the, the fraternity system is where the money came from. Uh, when they did that. And then um, there were a few uh, black uh, students in the early, uh, I guess in the 40s, maybe one or two, in the 50s, one or two. In fact, I know, I know one in the 40s, I know one in the 50s, and then in the 60s there were several. They lived off campus. They weren't allowed, from what I understand, to live in the dormitories. Combination of, of all the vibrancy of, of the civil rights movement, coupled with uh, then the onset of the Vietnam War and the uh, awful, uh, the assassination of two Kennedys, Martin Luther King, it was clear, clearly turmoil. It's a powerful story. I mean, I think it's, it is a part of the, the historic fabric of this country, you know, and in that it, and that it highlights or that, that it reminds us that in order to get anything, you know, you have to demand it. Power concedes nothing. You have to make the community acknowledge the fact that, that you're present and that there, there are specific needs that you have that aren't being met. And so the only way that you can do that, it sometimes is to be confrontational because if you ask politely, oftentimes you're not heard. If you start fooling around trying to uh, run a school on the basis of um, of uh, smart uh, white uh, men able to come to a uh, top quality institution, <laughs> you might not make your quota sometimes. <laughs> or in a, not, not to mention making a quota and then having something that has no relationship to the uh, world. And For the students of the period, there was a dramatic change between, I'm trying to say about 68 and 72. Uh, they saw the importance of putting more pressure on institutions to admit more black students to hire black faculty. And that, that impetus, which began on a few campuses, spread very rapidly around the country. We think of, as I said, Northwestern and, and uh, San Francisco State Cornell, places where there were significant actions um, by students, um, demonstrations, takeovers of buildings, and so forth. And those events not only affected the institutions where those individual, where those students were, but they affected colleges in general. Um, colleges began to feel that, that they needed to take some kind of action so that the same thing didn't have to have, happen on their campuses. And that resulted in a, a wave of, of uh, black students being admitted to, co to the colleges in the early 70s. Um, I entered in 72. I know when I was here there were 130. I remember that number. And I know the year before I came there was a takeover of the snack bar and also a takeover of Hopkins Hall because black students um, 
wanted recognition and they wanted support. The demography was definitely changing there, and uh, the, 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 it was clear that the country's population was looking different. Um, I also understand that the Jewish students were not allowed to live in the dormitories. In fact, there's Lehman Hall, which was actually built to house Jewish students. Actually, the, the groups that started with the BSU. The BSU was the minority group in, in the college. And then VISTA came, the Grupo Unido or VISTA, they were the Latino stu students. Mm -hmm. Then Asia also started getting, work, working together with, with this group. And now we have 14 organizations at the Multicultural Center. And I have to say that over the years, it has become increasingly diverse, both the student body and slowly the faculty. I think sometimes students don't understand um, that there will always be a lag in the diversity of faculty as opposed to the diversity of students. S students, we, you, you get 500 new students every year, right, with a concerted effort at diversity of some kind, right. Um, faculty, in the past, you hired you know, in a big year, maybe 15 to 20 new people. Now with the downturn, probably much, half that maybe. If you get tenure, you stay maybe, or for the most part, you know, we, we often stay. So it's going to be a long time before people retire and, and so on. So, and I, and I had to ex I've had to explain that to students. You can't always have peace to have a vibrant community. Sometimes you have to have friction. During the period of time of the founding of the Multicultural Center, uh, President Oakley really, um, really opened the doors uh, to this community. The full story of what, what happened is never clear to people, so you'll get alumni sort of stuff flowing in Monday morning quarterbacking. And in all the, you know, you're dealing with 18, 19, 20 year olds. So the, these are students that are sort of vulnerable period in their lives who've got themselves into a corner, usually by occupying a building, so in breach of all sorts of rules. You've got to get them out of the corner. I mean, there are students. I had a real sense that it was definitely his mission to open the doors of the campus and to um, and to provide opportunity for a broader base of um, students in the world, um, not just in our own country, but in the world. And um, a sort of sense that that would enrich this community, that it, that it was um, a mutual opportunity. There were students who, who um, for whatever reason, maybe there was an event that happened that inspired her. There was the catalyst, but clearly there was an emotion present. This student faced, I think the activism started with the students from California, especially because she was in the spring break, the beginning of the spring break, and one of her roommates asked her, are you, are you, are your parents coming for, for, for parents weekend or something like that? And she said, I don't think so. And then the, this student said, oh, I know, your parents kind of leave the fields. And in a place like this, 20 years ago, there weren't very many people who didn't look white. She felt like it was a like smack on their face. She didn't feel that she had to educate a, a, anybody, everybody here, but they started doing something to, just to create more awareness about the students that were here, that they were coming. The administration may say like, well, you're making a big deal out of this, and the students are like, no, we're not. We're serious and we're willing to put, we're willing to put whatever we have, whatever resources that we have out the, you know, out there, you know, our, all of our, all of our creative energy, all of our, our human resources, we're willing to put it out there and say, we're not going to, we're not going to go one step further until you begin to acknowledge our humanity and that we, we have certain needs that are, that are not being met. So that what happened is that, you know, these invited underrepresented students who are now participating in educational experiences are starting to say, but we need someplace, you know, that it's not enough to be in the student center, um, you know, that integration exists up to a certain extent, but 
there are still moments when, in fact, we need a place of our own. I thought that the group that formed to push the struggle for a multicultural center was, uh, they were a very mature, sophisticated group of, uh, of young people coming from various ethnic backgrounds. They were smart and, and um, they were not They were not motivated by uh, egotism. Uh, they were not uh, irrational in thinking about what could be done in the context of, of campus protest. That takeover was really um, a huge moment in Williams' history. And I, I was supportive in the sense that there were students outside supporting um, I remember just sitting there on the curb doing my reading just to, just to be there so they knew that I supported them. They uh, Ultimately, the Black Student Union had been put together, and I think if there's a legacy of the Black Student Union, it is that, that we would expect and appreciate that uh, when the uh, students come in, the various minority groups come in, they might organize themselves and find ways of talking, and they might be given uh, the latitude to do that. They form a group. Uh, called Minority Coalition that um, kind of separated from the student council and the college but not because they wanted to segregate it's because they wanted to do cultural things. There was a student protest, a sit-in in 1988. President Oakley responded from what I've read and understand there were committees put together to analyze the needs on campus, to look at other kinds of centers that were developing, and also to, to make a proposal for what the center would, would look like. And so in the spring of 1989, the Multicultural Center was um, established. The decision was made that they might look around on the faculty and put a faculty person over it. I compliment them without, uh, without um, uh, compromise for the courageous um, willingness to confront that question and to try that. I'm far more dubious about the person that they selected to do it because that was me. <laughs> it was both outward-looking and inward-looking, outward-looking to the community as a whole to educate uh, a community about the range of diversity, about different cultural streams that were flowing into what had been a, you know, a very monolithic institution. I do think that, that President Oakley should be remembered for having very forcefully and um, squarely confronted and affirmed the need to move in that direction. The community had like a, a big um, speak out in Chapin Hall. The place was packed to the rafters and, and President um, Oakley was there and the community could ask him any question that they wanted. And it was such a bold and co courageous thing to do. And by the time we get to the takeover, the building takeover and the formation of the MCC, we're talking about uh, uh, various um, other dimensions, uh, including uh, Latino students um, and uh, gay students, and which is now also part of the MCC, and women students. Community, I think, is strong. I think it's united. We have a great group through the Queer Student Union, a great group of united students that are doing political organizing. The college is committed to spending money on a queer life coordinator, on somebody that is here specifically as a resource for students, for staff. I'm here as a resource for staff and faculty, little known fact. Um, I'm here as a resource in regards to policy issues. Um, and the campus is dedicated to spending the money on that is some of the really good stuff that's happening. There's a take back the night uh, event every year and there's a uh, focus on reproductive issues and mm -hmm. reproductive freedom uh, and there are various other student actions uh, that, that happen so that 
there's a real effort to raise consciousness, but I think there are a lot of Williams women who still are nervous about affiliating with that, partly because of the homophobia that the first thing they'll be said is, oh, you're, you're, you're interested in feminism, then you must be a lesbian. And that's another issue, which is sort of the climate for queer students at Williams. I was a part of the committee, and then I was also a faculty member who decided, well, I'm going to collaborate with these people because I see what they're I see and I believe in what they're doing. There's a kind of evolution, and I think that's primarily what the center has seen for 20 years. You know, it's, it's expanded from the recognition of a need to now the recognition of new needs. The multicultural center and the fact that we have it was, to me, a really wonderful example of how Williams could be nimble, you know, and could learn on its feet. I think that the other access level here is the scale. You know, what is our scale? And our scale is primarily, you know, we're 2,000 students. Um, we are about 450 faculty. If you break down the math, that's a pretty good odd ratio. You know, you're going to be a part of a learning environment in which people know who you are. Um, you're not going to be invisible. I've been here now 25 years. What I've learned is that. This is a community that can embrace a broad range of aspirations, a broad range of personality types. And sometimes in a community, um, having everybody be the same creates a kind of mayonnaise that no one wants. But as I look out here now, this is just a totally different place. I envy you. I would love to attend the institution that I'm seeing in front of me. I mean, it was tough. I mean, I think when you come here, when you visit here, it's, I feel like the institution is supposed to, they have an agenda to make you feel welcome, you know? I'm not saying that's wrong, I feel like, you know, like if you had a guest over, you'd want them to, if you wanted to come back, or, you know, if you actually cared about them, you'd want them to, you know, you'd want to make them feel welcome. So I feel like me coming here during previews and then coming, like, as a student, it was, it was two different things. When I first came here as a student, I remember the first day I just, felt completely awkward. I also know that as human beings, very often we tend to not take advantage of the differences that surround us for a variety of reasons. I mean, one of them is that we seek comfort. You know, we try to find those things that are familiar and similar. And I know for many of you as students, that's gonna be an important transition. Uh, finding a place that's comfortable for you, making that transition from home and high school you know, to Williams College. It, it's like I've been invited for dinner, but I know that, that I'm a guest, you know, as opposed to a part of the family. And I did have some smooth transition, at least in coming to New York City, where it's the mecca of the world, you know. But coming into Williams, it's, uh, it was a different context in that I had to, you know, I was definitely the minority. Sorry, there's a problem here, which is, we look for the brightest and the best, so we recruit and we go to any kind of high school and we say, and now we have a free ride system where if you're good enough, you come to Williams on total full scholarship, you don't pay a penny. So you come out of here without debt, okay? Um, which is lovely, but we don't, but we expect, it seems that we expect you to be not only the brightest and the best, but a certain type of person from a certain kind of background. And that's not possible. I've been doing a lot of um, readings about social class in America lately. And when I tell my story about coming to Williams, it, it was really some sort of like spark of luck or something that got me to that post office before it closed because I was working a full-time job as an accountant in a supermarket. Uh, and that was my way of providing for my household. My mother at the time was unemployed and it was a very hard situation. My father passed away before we came to the States. They come here, they're, they're abnormally stressed, <laughs> you know, um, and there aren't really, there aren't, there's not really much that they feel like they have access to in terms of coping. And so, what do they do? They withdraw. They go and leave. You know, they couldn't find that one person to connect to because nobody was paying attention. It wasn't really set in stone for me to go to college, I thought I would have to go to 
you know, get a full-time job. And then with a lot of my peers, I had to do just start working right after high school and you know, not really think of college. Not only in terms of um, kind of uh, racial identity um, and things of that nature, um, sexual orientation as well, but it's it's really segregated along lines of kind of a soci socioeconomic status. I remember for my when you arrive to your dorm, you get asked for entry dues. And at that time, I'm not sure if that's still the case, you're, you were asked to give entry dues for you know, social programming that the entry puts together. And I was really embarrassed. I only had $40 in my pocket and I kept hiding <laughs> from my, not that they were hunting me down, but I kept hiding and not wanting to go to the, you know, the Sunday night snacks and those type of things because I, I said, I really need this 40 dollars maybe to send them back to my mother. The thing that actually surprised me most was the um, the level of wealth at Williams. I, I live in a neighborhood that was kind of um, ravaged by the end of American steel industry in the late 1970s. There's a lot of feelings from people who are from either one social class and then experience it different and encounter with a different social class. When I got to Williams, it was kind of a wealth I had never experienced before. So I definitely noticed a class difference even within the Asian American community. As small as it is, um, there's like, I think that this, there's this desire to, um, you know, get along with each other and have a small, small knit community. But even within that small group where we're trying to, we're deliberately trying to forge a community that there are certain differences. People who have a lot of money sometimes are just, it's kind of polite to be nice. There, there's obviously class issues in America, right, which we don't talk about as much. Well, I, I think the, the stereotype that I had in my mind when you're coming to such an institution of the caliber that Williams portrays out there, it's, you know, thinking about your first day of classes and thinking about how preppy it may be and, you know, what standards or expectations I had to kind of fit in into the community or how should I mold myself to look, even how I dress or how, you know, and what were the expectations for me in the classroom? You know, all those things I had to grapple with in my first year. And the performance issues too, I mean, if you come in and you, you, you're a good student back there and you start not doing particularly well, quite frankly, what you gotta do is relate to the capacity in that work, not start relating it to your race or gender or something and silencing yourself. So that is kind of a, the little challenge. It's, I, mean, I think it's very difficult, but, but uh, you know, it's just one that you make for yourself. The last year, I, I mean, I was, man, I mean, academically, I sucked. <laughs> I come from a, I came from a really horrible public school system. When I took those tests, the placement tests, it definitely was quite shocking for me to feel so unprepared as I did and and you know the Williams tells you you know your placement tests are just that a placement test but for me to a person that used to hold higher standards in terms of what I wanted to achieve and be placed in a remedial course at the beginning of my career was really tough. You come here and it's just all this stuff. you don't know a lot of these words what they mean you don't know how to attack this like you know this packet this course packet you don't know how to like take you know participate in class you know what to say like how do you really push yourself if you've never been pushed so there's, there's lots of small things where the college would do well to try to figure out how to bring things on balance my mom dropped me over for like forty dollars in my pocket that's all i had i mean it wasn't until very recently that like yeah, senior week stuff which is really expensive that the college started subsidizing that um, for for seniors who couldn't afford it. So, you know, the backgrounds, we can no longer make these assumptions, I think, that we used to make about Williams students. Muslim community is actually working pretty well here. We are pretty small. We are in total like 30 people or so. Um, but it's, it's a lot compared to what it used to be. It used to be like four or five. Because, for example, the first time I came here, nobody believed that I was Muslim. I was like, I started fasting during Ramadan. I'm like, are you really Muslim? I'm like, yeah. Sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm fasting. I'm pretty sure I'm Muslim. <laughs> and this is like what we're trying to do. We're trying to build those activities where people can learn more and more about Islam because there's this really wrong perception of Islam. This just very, everyone thinks that if someone is practicing there, like this radical Islamist. For example, this year we had this thing, Fastathon. It's like during Ramadan, the month we fast. 
people donated their uh, breakfast and lunch points and we donated to them them to uh, this orga Goodrich organization where uh, they fund Afghan, Afghan students to come and study in the United States. From what I've learned, I think basically is just don't have any assumptions about where people are coming from. And, um, I think that's the main lesson that I've learned and just um, learning about different people navigating through these complicated cross-sections between race and class um, and this desire to build community and whether or not the community needs to come from just a homogenous group or and that you know expect differences and it's okay that you can um, build relations with people even if they're different. Well what I've found in my 25 years here is not to uh, is to expect the unex unexpected, I'd say. But, I mean, just little things like that. Um, if the college could think of how to, how, how to do things so that that works out correctly. I think for me, at that time, it was a safe space to be away at and be able to reflect and not feel afraid of where I was. Well, the Multicultural Center, the Multicultural, the multicultural Center basically housed all the minority groups. MENCO, the Minority Coalition, it is uh, essentially the umbrella organization for all of the affinity groups that exist um, at Williams. So these are these are historically underrepresented groups and so they can fall under ethnic or racial categories or sometimes religious categories. Gay people, um, Koreans, um, South Asians, uh, Chinese students, uh, the Latino students, and it's just amazing because when you belong to one group, you you speak the same language. You have everything from the Black Student Union to students of Caribbean ancestry to um, the Jewish Student Association to um, to the Muslim Student Association. So you have all of these different groups that exist. Then we have a connection with this group, Minko, the Minority Coalition. Then we, what we do is basically we budget their, the money for events. Um, we do, we help them to do the programming. Uh, and again, I think is that we kind of represent the students. Basically, we are we are here for the students. But I always remember seeing this lady who um, would, you know, be very outspoken and you know, with this camera and, you know, she was from Mexico City and she was very proud of expressing where she was from. And I remember her coming to the meetings, seeing her at various functions on campus. And, you know, somehow along the way, we started connecting and, you know, I started to find out more about uh, where she worked at, which was Marcella, Marcella Peacock at the Multicultural Center. And so, she was very welcoming. I think the one thing that's clear that has worked well over there since the outset is, is what Marcella does, which is to be a mother to all the students who come through. And that's something that she began doing as a kind of personal initiative. And it's become institutionalized, but there's never been a mandate or a vision around that. It's just, it's her. Marcella is like a mom to me. I. I absolutely love Marcella, you know, and I've gotten to work so closely with her because I am, I, I work under her, so I basically, you know, just spend a ton of time with her. The majority of students didn't understand about the, that you get together for meals. I think for different cultures, the meals are important. It's not what you eat, it's just gathering. When you come to this country, they take your religion, they take your name, but they cannot even, they cannot take whatever you eat at home. I, I, would, I would say they're warm and loving and um, welcoming, definitely. Um, you know, the person who's uh, like a reef, he really sort of helped me with the whole poetry aspect and, you know, performing and spoken word. And I think if I didn't have that, I would have had you know, a completely different first year experience. If there's something that, that a friend confides in me that I can't do anything about, 
then I need to know who to talk to to help them. You know what I mean? And that can be anything from as as little as like, we want to go to an entry dinner, but that friend doesn't have any money or that friend is like, you know, something, that friend has been sexually assaulted. Who do I talk, who do I talk to? Because the student shouldn't be the, the person that bears that burden. That's why we're hired to do this, you know? You know, that's why we're hired to do to intervene and to inform and to advocate and to help resolve these issues. You have Marcella, who's this incredibly welcoming, um, loving presence with her camera, just creating communities through taking her pictures. And then you have Arif and you have Justin. Um, right now you have Ed as the academic director. Uh, and so you have a group of people who are really committed to uh, supporting all kinds of events on campus. If not for these places, people wouldn't voice out there, like, I don't know, some misgivings that they might have thinking they're the only one. But then, like, if there are more people like them saying the same things, then it's something more solid and legitimate to talk about. Like For me, I mean, just seeing now the groups of uh, these students gathering and just even asking their mothers for recipes to cook the their meals and all the stuff is just amazing. Williams is a surprisingly um, innovative and modern place, although it has a conservative tradition. And so we have the, the, the demography, the demographics have changed, the emphasis have, has changed on the way people teach and what, they, what the emphases are placed on um, issues of diversity and recognition of an American population. And I think the MCC has served to make the college confront its own um, past, which is a past mired in white male students. The college has recognized that appearance is not a satisfactory level to be attained and to be comfortable with. So it's more about well, what is it that you want to become? What is the ideal? Well, the ideal is that the college should look like every place else. It should look like the country. It should look like the world. I want to be able to read past that person that you that you perform for me when you see me coming. You see what I'm saying? Because that's what happens. Students perform because they they know they well they know that I'm going to ask some questions that they may not want to answer. You know, because I'm asking questions of concern, like how are you doing? And they're going to I'm good. You know, I'm busy. I'm tired. Okay. What else? I see that there's some, you know, how do we peel back that underbelly? You know, like I want to peel back the underbelly. What's really going on? Don't, don't, don't sugarcoat it for me. You know, like, you know me, you know, and if you don't know me, you're about to know me. Like, <laughs> People still come up against walls that are based on their own time. You know, what's happening in the world and what's happening in the culture that they find themselves in at the moment. But if an institution can have structures in place that help students um, find their way um, and that support them in finding their way. The institution is healthier um, for it and student life is all the richer for it. And, you know, the multicultural center plays is important partly because of that. Um, it provides, even though it's got an educative role to the campus at large, it also provides a sense of, of some sort of belonging for students. I think they've done a good job because of the problems we haven't had. I think they have accommodated the needs of, of students to see their culture represented on the campus in some kind of way. They've responded to the need to provide a place and a structure that allows them as individuals to get together with, with other people who share their cultural experience and to feel the benefit of that kind of sharing while still being Williams students and, and fully involved in the whole range of being a generic Williams student. Part of what we're doing, I think we're trying to make the college look familiar, um, to not look unique, to not look as if it's um, an isolated environment. Uh, to which you are a temporary guest. Going forward, I would like for the Multicultural Center to be, to permeate this institution, to be so pervasive, so so integral to the Williams experience that that people wouldn't ask, where's Jeanette's house? That um, people wouldn't 
people wouldn't look at Marcella, you know, one of the most fabulous women in this community and say, who is she? I hope that we can find a way to, um, to go into the future that provides better structure, better support, a clearer vision for the people who manage it, and better conceived ways for faculty to interact with the MCC as an institution within the institution. Who knows, somewhere that way down the road there be, may be no need, as it were, for a so-called multicultural center. If that day comes, let it come, you can live with that too. But I think right now and for the past, uh, for the past two decades, it's, uh, it's served a function. And uh, it, um, it's, it shouldered, it shouldered uh, some, uh, some burdens and responsibilities. I think some of which are not quite recognized and marked up and so forth by, uh, uh, by the rest of us who are, who, are, who are outside. And I think it's necessary, unfortunately that there needs to be safe space. Right? I know some white students have complained that it's self-segregation or whatever, but you know, white students basically have the rest of the campus in which they feel safe. And you know, some people are very, very uh, uh, susceptible to the notion that uh, the differences in the world necessarily means conflict and negative um, relationships and so forth, which there's enough of that in the world, of course. A part of their Williams narrative, a slice of their Williams narrative should have MCC written all on it. And I actually had this fantasy, what if we just took the building and moved it right onto Presky Lawn? <laughs> and how, how dramatically that would change its profile if it were right there in the center of campus. Even if it's just a damn tour that comes through the building, like people should know this place. And, and not just in a, a superficial way, but like know the place, you know, know the people, you know, know the work that we do. And it's not gonna surprise you that when you have an institution that has historically been white American Christians, and you start from the Jewish president and others, start talking about this brave new Williams, a brand new Williams, to celebrate that we should all embrace. Some people look at that vision and they get a little scared by that. But nobody in this tent is scared. And nobody on the faculty and staff are scared. We understand our challenge and we embrace that challenge. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah.